thank you. It's, it's an honor, a pleasure to be here. So now we have a set amount of time. Uh, the title is From Principles to Performance. And I'd say that uh, I always find it challenging to speak to non-radiologists uh, because I don't know exactly what you guys want to uh, hear. So I'll do my best. Um, I have a disclosure. Uh, I have received a little bit of cash from a company that talks about, no, they work on artificial intelligence and prostate cancer, but nothing related to this talk. This is the outline. We're going to talk very briefly about sequences. We're going to very briefly review anatomy, cancer on MRI, talk about pyrads and you now it's the agnostic use and accuracy, a little bit of post-radiation, unusual case, and we'll conclude. Um, it's a very you know, extensive topic to cover an hour, so I'll do my best here. So first thing is, what is multiparametric MRI? Um, you hear this all the time, and, and multiparametric doesn't really mean anything except that we are acquiring several sequences. And when we talk about prostate, you now we're talking about T2-weighted images, we're talking about diffusion-weighted images, contrast-enhanced images, and spectroscopy which really is no longer done. So essentially, it's T2 diffusion in DC. Now, you probably heard of biparametric MRI. And biparametric means two parameters, so two sequences. And the idea is that you acquire T2-weighted images and diffusion-weighted MRI. So that's a very simple you know, description of what an MR scan of the prostate is composed of. Now, there's. There are reasons to use each one of these sequences. And I remember talking to a urologist once, and you know, he kept asking, you know, we were writing a grant, and he kept asking, how do we you know, describe this, and why is this? And then the easiest way to describe it to him was, okay, think of MR as not, not as a single test, but think of MR as multiple different exams, multiple different lab tests that are acquiring the same machine. Each one of the parameters we acquire provides slightly different type of information. So we have the T2-weighted images that will look at anatomy, diffusion, we'll look at obviously diffusion of water, uh, DC, we'll look at the enhancement patterns, and spectroscopy at metabolites. And when you take all of these together, now you obviously will have more information and you're more likely to actually come to you know, a diagnosis as you guys do, you now actually seeing the tumor. So, I don't want to, first, I'm not a physicist, so uh, if I say too much, I'm going to say it wrong. But what is T2-weighted image? So again, um, it's, it's one of the sequences that we use for anatomy. We're basically looking at the structure of the prostate. Now we're looking at the zones of the prostate, addition, addition, uh, organs that are adjacent to it, vessels, urethra, etc. cetera. Um, but if you want to know what really T2 means, it's basically how quickly the MR signal will fade um, after you excite it. Now basically we are exciting protons and they're spinning in funny ways and eventually that signal will fade out. That's the T2 signal. Um, and that's as far as I go for this particular talk here. But this is what we get out of T2-weighted image. So three different patients, three different prostates, two of them acquired with a transvactal ultrasound, the first two and then one without it. We can see, and I did it on purpose, you can see the quality of the image without the direct acquired today are very good. We don't really need this anymore. We have a peripheral zone, which is bright in signal. And then we have a transition and central zone that are inseparable, really. Mostly what we're seeing is transition zone because guess what? All men have BPH when they get a prostate MR. So we're just saying that hyperplastic tissue. Um, and it's too, too hard to distinguish really from um, the central zone. Now diffusion weighted MR, uh, it's a different uh, approach now. What we're looking is average motion of water molecules, basically. So we have this Brownian motion, and if you have a glass of water and you put water in there, that those molecules will be moving freely because the, the space is huge, right? It's a glass of water. Um, but now when you start you know, decreasing that space, decreasing that space, and now you're in a, in a cell that has you know, a massive nucleus and there is you know, less fluid, now you start seeing less of that motion within that particular space. Now, it's not only the motion, but it's motion over time and motion over direction. You can acquire it in different ways. We can play with this to highlight the things that we want to see. 
So here we have three images um, of you know, different um, uh, specimens. And it goes from the more normal to the very abnormal uh, pattern. And on the top, we have those little circles. And what we're trying to get with diffusion is to get those different signals. So with a very normal um, gland, your diffusion-weighted MR will have not really restricted diffusion, so it's going to be a darkened signal. When you go to the other extreme, you're going to have very bright signal because you have this packed environment of cells, and the cells are abnormal too, so you, you have a bright signal. And then you have in between a gray zone, and, and that gray can vary multiple shades, 50 if you wish, um, depending on you know, what the cells and what the tissue looks like. <clears throat> so essentially what we're trying to do is distinguish these two types of tissues. In one of them, we have a bunch of cells moving more freely because the cells are bigger. In the other one, you have cells of various sizes, um, various shapes, and that will impact how we capture the signal. Now, you probably heard of B values too, because radiologists love to talk about B values. And now, basically, this is one of the things that we can use in diffusion to increase the contrast between what's normal and abnormal. So you now gradients are um, basically how fast the MR will change from one direction or another signal. That leads to greater B value, that leads to greater diffusion weighting, that leads to better contrast. So you can imagine here, again, a more abnormal you know, sample of tissue and a more normal sample of tissue. And the signal is brighter and the more abnormal because of those cells that are more abnormal. And there are techniques that actually can try to lead to this here where you're going to suppress the more normal signal and keep only the abnormal one, so you further increase the contrast. Um, there are several different types of diffusion-weighted images and approaches to diffusion-weighted image, but this is all based on this concept. So here is a T2-weighted image and a diffusion-weighted um, image. We have a tumor that's closer to the apex and a little bit more anterior. On the T2, it's dark, and then you have that very bright signal on the diffusion-weighted image. And you can see how easy it is to identify that tumor on the diffusion compared to the T2. And that's one of the values of diffusion-weighted MR. It's simpler for us to just look at it and see it. And then we have what we call the ADC map. So ADC stands for apparent diffusion coefficient. And it's nothing but a more objective assessment of diffusion. We can try to quantify how much restriction there is in that particular no, tissue. Um, why does that matter? Why well, it matters because it's been shown that those numbers are uh, inversely correlated with uh, diffusion is inversely correlated with Gleason score. So there are studies that show that we can predict a tumor that's high grade versus a lower grade tumor uh, based on this type of finding. Um, so again, we have a normal gland where there is nothing really that's restricted. Th those are two ADC maps. And in one of them, we don't have any signal that's abnormal. And the other one, you have a fairly large tumor. Um, and it's dark in signal, has more restricted diffusion. And again, we can plot that. And we can show that as Gleason score goes up, you have a lower ADC value. Now. Again, this is just to mention why, why you may hear things. People talk, oh, was this a B value? And I hear this from colleagues. Oh, do you do multiparametric? And patients do multiparametric. I do. We do multiparametric MR. We have done this forever. And um, well, do you use high B value images? Yeah, we use high B value images. But what is it, right? And what's the point of it? So here is an example of a low B value and a high B value acquired at the same time. It's the same patient, the same time, the same scanner. And with the change in the B value, we increase the contrast, which was what I mentioned before in that other slide. So that's the rationale behind this. The problem then is someone, well, why you stop the you know, 1,350? Why not go to 3,000? That's because then we don't have any signal. The more we wait to acquire the images, the more likely those protons will actually come back to a rest state, and then you don't have any signal. So we could wait, 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 and then an image, and then it's just a black box, and we don't see anything. So there's a balance there. It's always a trade-off. This way. Contrast-enhanced MRI. So this is another one of the parameters that we're going to use. Um, 
So it's an image that's based on the use of gadolinium. We inject the gadolinium, and gadolinium will flow in vessels, and then we'll get into the organs, and we're going to have an increase in the signal in one of our sequences, which is the T1-weighted sequence. So it will make things more evident. So we can do that for you now identifying focal lesions, tumors. You now comparing a more um, unenhanced area to a more enhanced area, just as we did with diffusion. We can do that to detect vessels. We do it with MR and geography, for example, for pre-op planning. Um, and we can do that to assess perfusion, which is one of the main reasons we do it with prostate cancer. Now, a little side thing here, people you know, talk a lot about um, NSF and nephrotic stem fibrosis. And you should know more than I do about that because it came from pathology, actually. But, you know, this is one of the issues that people always bring up. I say, I want to do my biparametric MR. So remember I said we can do biparametric without the contrast. And one of the main worries is this. And now with deposits and various, you know, different organs, bones, brain, etc. Now, NSF is a non-issue. Gadolinium has changed. The, the, the formulas of gadolinium, the, the, the molecular structure of gadolinium has changed, and we have what we call group two agents, which are the one that we use. We don't use group one anymore. Group one was associated with NSF. Group two has not been associated. It's many years that we don't have cases. And the risk of NSF in patients with low GFR, so if you have stage four or five chronic kidney disease, it's basically zero. So it's safe to use gadolinium, but even within radiology, people are still, oh, no, I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to. There is no reason to it anymore. All right, so DC, dynamic contrast enhanced MRI. This is the perfusion approach. It's a dynamic process. So we're acquiring multiple sequences over time of that same spot, and we're trying to detect tumor angiogenesis, and we're trying to look at permeability and contrast leakage um, from the, into the extravascular and extracellular components of tissue. So how do we do that? Um, you inject the contrast and you acquire images at different time points. So here is just you know, two images of 45 seconds and 185 seconds for illustration purposes. Obviously, we can do it every seven seconds, for example, and just keep acquiring for a period of five minutes, for example. And that will allow us to, to, to assess it in different ways. So the simplest way to do it is to just do visual inspection. So you look at the 45 seconds, and there is a dot that's very bright. There is contrast enhancement. It's 45 seconds, so I know it's early. So it's early enhancement that is suspicious for prostate cancer. And if I wait you know, longer, then the rest of the gland will you now enhance, and that becomes inconspicuous then. So the timing is crucial. And because of that, people then said, well, might as well look at all the different time points. And this is what people do, for example, with breast imaging. It's probably the very first group to do it. So you, you, as I said, you have many time points, so you can plot the curve, and you can see how fast that enhancement is occurring and how fast or slow the washout is happening to. And prostate cancer tends to be early enhancing, quick washout compared to the more normal tissue, which is the green curve, where you have this sort of slow, in, slowly increasing slope. Um, and then you have um, another approach, which is still looking at the time points and the curves, but you can create parametric maps, which is what radiologists really like. Now, we can do little lines and look at lines, but we don't find it fun. So you can create a parametric map where you have the initial slope and you have the washout slope plotted on an image, and that's even easier for us. And then the last thing are pharmacokinetic models, which really try to attempt, it's an attempt to replicate now, what happens in the physiology and pathophysiology with all the leakages and all the different compartments, but these are all models and mathematical models, right? Um, so one may expect, okay, the leakage will happen at this rate, um, and this is what we're going to use as you know, our parameter to calculate. Now, we, you know, one of the various different um, measures that we can make. Uh, the problem is that it's really not reproducible even within an institution, if you have a very, very tight protocol, a very highly, no, a highly specialized group, you can probably do this. But in a place like ours, we can't because we have various different scanners, we have different techs, and, and 
And even within a very tight place, patients also vary. You have someone that comes with you know, cardiac, no heart failure, and then their cardiac output is already all messed up, and then your image is all messed up and it doesn't really work. So there's very limited reproducibility, and we don't, we don't really use that unless we're doing research. And then you have MR spectroscopic imaging, which is basically looking at metabolites. Choline is high in prostate cancer. Citrate is high in normal tissue. So you can look at the ratios of these two components. And based on the ratios of these components, you can say if something is cancer or if something is not cancer. So here, for example, you have high choline, low citrate in this corner, which represents this tumor here. And if you look at other areas, now the peak is very low for, cit uh, for choline, high for citrate, and we're looking at this area here now. So what we're doing, we're doing two things. We're taking the signal intensity of frequency, which is what we use to look at metabolites, and we're overlapping it with the anatomy, which is the T2-aided image. That's how we get this box here, so we can co-localize it to the T2. So here are two examples, choline citrate, choline citrate. And this works. It works, but it's dead. No one is really using it anymore. And I, I wrote a little thing about this. So UCSF was probably one of the main sites using MR spectroscopic imaging for the prostate, and we had to give up on it. And it basically, for the same reason, we didn't use pharmacokinetic models because of the complexity of the technique. All right. Anatomy, very, very briefly, because you are the experts on anatomy and not me. Um, but I, I do want to highlight that we can actually see many of the things that no, you guys see, even though we see it in a slightly different way. So now we can see the anterior femoral muscular stroma, we have low T2 signal intensity. Transition zone and um, central zone are difficult to separate. I mentioned this before. And again, because all, virtually all the men with image, they have BPH already, so then the transition zone dominates. The peripheral zone I showed you before, we can see that as well, high signal intensity on T2. The so-called capsule, and I put quotes, I know there's no capsule there, but we do see a thin line of low T2 signal that surrounds the gland. Uh, it's an artifact, uh, but that artifact helps us to determine too when you have extra prosthetic extension, for example. Um, we divide as everyone else in base, mid gland, and apex, the, you know, the gland, and why am I bringing this? It's because maybe we are placing that we're describing something as mid-gland, urologist places a needle and they take tissue and then they send to you guys and then it will be saying, okay, this is coming from the mid-gland. So it's probably a good idea if you used to know what is the mid-gland for us. We are basically just cutting in thirds without any anatomical reference. One third, one third, and one third. Now, it matters a little bit because when urologist does it, they have a, a transducer that is angled this way. And the beam of the, the sound also opens up like you no know, light, right? So when they talk about mid gland, base, and apex, it's probably not the same thing as we're talking about. And it's important for you guys to know what we refer to. So we're literally just doing one third, one third, one third, um, if we want to then correlate. Now we can look at seminal vesicles, now we can look at um, the bladder, we can look at vas deferens, we can look at the ejaculatory ducts. All of those things are visible on MR. And every once in a while we'll deal with some of these uh, patients with have involvement, uh, maybe metastatic disease to the vas deferens, and sometimes you see these you know, funny nodules that are far out there. Um, everything is visible, although we're not seeing it necessarily the same way the pathology does. So, so here's just an example you know, of a more distal um, uh, vast bilaterally. Uh, ejaculatory ducts, we can see as well. Uh, we can see the duct coming down and then joining the veromontanum there. We can see the urethra. This is something that radiation oncology is you know, always you know, reminding us, you know, we need to know where it is, especially when they're planning treatment based on MR. Oftentimes they'll have a catheter, it makes it a little bit easier for us to, but even without a catheter, we can see it, we can follow, we can highlight it. Now, the venous plexus is another thing that we can see. And one of the reasons I'm bringing it up, it's because it's also one of the fun pitfalls in radiology. So, now the, the yellow arrow in the center is pointing to 
a diffusion-weighted MR and an ADC map that corresponds to the diffusion-weighted MR. And this is a patient that had microscopic low Gleason score on active surveillance. And the radiologist looked at this and saw that area of restricted diffusion and described it as being a pyrads 4 We'll talk about pyrads later. Um, but now that increases the worry that, okay, something is wrong here. Maybe this patient does not have a Gleason 3. Maybe this was missed, and uh, maybe this patient shouldn't be in active surveillance, right? Uh, but really what that is is just a vein. And we can actually see, oops, I thought it was a slide there. Let me go back. We can actually see the vein right here. Um, so now we can see the venous plexus anteriorly. We can see it surrounding the vessel. And again, this is one of the fun pitfalls that um, we have. Um, neurovascular bundle, we see it as little dots and lines. And we really see it you know, at the base before it spreads out. Now, as we go down in interior, we, we can't really identify it. But when we do see it at the base, and here is an example of what it looks like, so little dots and lines. And when you have tumor, it's usually something that's very obvious that we can call. Now, we miss tumors that um, extend beyond the extra prostate, uh, extra, the capsule. Uh, often, you, I'm sure you guys see that. We call it negative, and you identify it because we can't see the microscopic uh, components. I'm not sure why that slide was there. It was supposed to have been deleted. So here's a summary of the typical anatomy on, on MRI. We have bright signal on the T2 peripheral zone, very heterogeneous transition zone with BPH nodules, statistic component, stromal component, um, and the diffusion, no restricted diffusion and ADC map. You can see now that there are areas that have low signal. Right, so this is very bright in here, area of low signal. And this is where the problems start happening for radiology and why I want to bring this up. This is contrast. You can see that BPH nodules enhance, and the T1, it's really useless without the contrast. So let's go to this slide here. Let's talk a little bit about partial volume averaging effect. And so all the images on MR are formed by a, a, a cube. You have a little voxel, a cube of tissue. Um, and, and maybe we have a, a one that has just water, right? Just plain water versus another one that has dirt. And when you have just a single tissue component, you, know, you get the signals that are very different from each other. They're quite the opposite. But more often than not, we have really a mix of tissues within the voxel. And each one of these components will provide a little bit of the signal that will be blended and averaged, and we're going to get then the gray, right? So this is basically how um, you know, we work every day. So here, for example, we have a very large tumor that has very marked restricted diffusion. And now we can say that this is just a block of dirt. Everything in that area there is one type of tissue. It's providing the signal. It's very obvious. While on the other one, you have something that's a little bit faded. Now we can see that there is some restricted diffusion there too. And the T2 signal is not as dark as the other one. The ADC is not as dark. And in here, what we have is this mix. We have normal tissue and we have abnormal tissue blending in. So to make it a little bit easier to, to understand what we're looking at, we're looking at maybe some cells that are somewhat abnormal, we still have some glandular you know, um, forms there. You have normal glands, you have the stromal tissue. Um, while on the other one, you only have this blob of cells. It's like this block of abnormal cells. So when you average the normal tissue, the, normal, um, the abnormal glands, and inflammation, and, and maybe there's some calcification there too, all these things will average. And this is what we usually see. This is the more common thing. And that's why things oftentimes are not very obvious. And again, this will have an impact later on what we need to do. But as people say in medicine and love, we never say never, never say always. There will be always exceptions. And here is a case where you have a fairly normal T2 weighted image and a fairly abnormal um, contrast enhanced and diffusion weighted MR. And this was a Gleason 3 plus 4 and a fairly large one. So there are cases where things don't work as we expect them to work. Now, Again, this is a similar example, uh, just to highlight some of the things that we see. Anterior tumor, the apex. This is one of the accepted indications for MR by urologists. P2 
PSA continues to go up, the biopsy was negative, they get an MR, they will usually miss it at the apex and they're going to use it when it's anterior. Um, now this is another example of a prostate cancer. Um, this is not in the anterior gland, it's in the peripheral zone, it's posterior and lateral. And we can see that there's a discrepancy between the T2 weighted image, where you have this low signal intensity that extends throughout the, the peripheral zone, and then you have the, uh, the, the post-contrast image that shows it only at one particular point. And what's happening here is that this patient had a biopsy then previously, and then had the MR, and that low signal intensity in the T2 is hemorrhage. So it looks like a big tumor, but it's not. It's just part of it that's tumor. And here is another example of a T2-weighted image that's very abnormal, has very low signal intensity. When you look at the T1-weighted image, we see that there's a lot of hemorrhage in that. Again, this was post-biopsy hemorrhage. And that's one of the reasons why, especially in the past, we would say, okay, don't acquire MR if you had a biopsy than two weeks ago. Wait at least four weeks, six to eight weeks, even better. We still do that, we still try to do it, but I think people got used to it and we don't, we don't have those cases coming up as often. But then hemorrhage is not the only reason why we can have discrepancies. So here's another patient that had BCG treatment for bladder cancer, had elevated PSA, got an MR, we can see this very low signal intensity on the T2 in the peripheral zone, and then you have a little bit of restricted diffusion, not a whole lot. And this is tricky, you know, because we can you know, bring up the possibility of cancer, but in reality this was granulomatous prostatitis because of his BCG, it got treatment, it got better. So now this is just two examples uh, where we have you know, two mimics. And, and again, there are more things. The peripheral zone versus the transition zone is one thing. So here we have um, a tumor in the peripheral zone, and the yellow arrow is pointing to it. And then we have the white arrow showing the normal part of the gland. You already saw this, low signal intensity on T2, and then you have restricted diffusion. Now, this is a vein again, just to identify you know, vessels. And again, this is somebody you may see. And if someone, for whatever reason, gets a biopsy or something like that, you will know. Now, here is the normal and abnormal transition zone. So the yellow arrow, again, is pointing to the cancer, and the white arrow is pointing to normal hyperplastic, no, normal hyper, I guess not, commonly seen hyperplastic tissue. Okay, so here are four cases, and two of them have cancer, and two of them don't. And now, now you start looking at this, okay, the, just to say, this is a tumor in the peripheral zone, don't look at that one. Now, I'm talking about the transition zone here. So two of them have cancer and two of them don't. And, and this is how no, we have to deal with this every day. It's, it's very challenging because you see areas of low T2 signal and you have areas of restricted diffusion in all of these images. So here are the two tumors. The rest of it was not. The rest of it is all just transition zone with hyperplastic nodules. So how do we deal with this? Like how do we distinguish this thing? And this is the main challenge that we have. And again, when you come to the end of this, I will bring it up again. Again, just to mention extraprostatic extension, when we see it, it's going to be a lot of, uh, of extraprostatic extension to the pathologist because we do miss microscopic. We definitely cannot see you know, uh, capsule involvement that's microscopic. Now, we can mention it, and then our reports include if the gland, uh, I mean, if the tumor abuts the, the, the periphery of the gland and it's greater than a centimeter, 1.5 centimeters, we bring it up, the possibility of involvement with the capsule that's microscopic, um, but we cannot prove it, and probably doesn't really matter for treatment anyways, because they can get a margin irrespective. But no, when we see it, when we call it, you should see something ginormous there. Pyrads. So let's move to the thing. So this is the world of radiologists and, and, and the rest of the world, and maybe we can put pathology here too. I'm not 100% sure. But we have this image in our minds, and then we're going to transmit that image, and we're going to use words. And, and, in, and then somehow it gets to the other brain like this. And, and then they're mad at us, and it's not my fault that they didn't get it. No, I, I had the clear image in my mind, they didn't, and they misunderstood it. And one of the reasons why this happened is because 
for a long time, we had different brands of scanners, different magnet strands, different coils that we were using to acquire images, different scoring systems, and even within the scoring system, there was inconsistency, and it was a big mess. So PyRes was developed to try to address that at least to a certain extent. Right? We are at version 2.1, which was released in 2019, so I would expect to have a new version 3 or 2.2 in another year or two. The ACR waits to collect data to try to make improvements, obviously. But what can we think about it? It's basically a way to standardize MR, interpretation, acquisition, and improve quality. So like an ISO type of thing. This is not of a lot of interest to you, but it's good to know that it's not perfect. And when you look at this, you can see it's not perfect. So we acquire a multi-parametric MR, so T2, diffusion, and DC. And people really love it, they think it's great. So if for the peripheral zone, if you look at the DWI score, so if you look at one sequence, it basically take cares of, it take, takes care of the score one, the score two, the score four or five. And DC and T2 don't really matter anymore. So we are acquiring three different t tests no, we're not doing the spectroscopy anymore, but three different tests. And then we're going to say, I'm going to ignore the results of these two. I'm just going to look at this here, and this is it. Except when you get a, a score three. Um, and then there's other issues with it. So this is how they describe markedly hypo-intense. Now, and it's, it's really, I don't know who wrote this. And they're all my friends, by the way, and I tell them the same thing. I don't know which one wrote it, but it's crazy. It's signal intensity that's lower than expected for normal or abnormal tissue. Okay, so it's lower than anything else, because normal and abnormal encompasses everything. Of the reference type, I have no idea what that means. For example, what is involved with calcification or blood or gas, it, it, and there is no definition of markedly hyper-intense. How am I supposed to know how to do it, right? So no, I just tell people, if it's something that a lay person can look and see that's different, that's markedly. Everything else, you, know, you, you play it as not being markedly, and I'm playing with specificity rather than sensitivity here. Um, so now here again to highlight what tumors look like and what markedly actually means. This is markedly abnormal. You can see there's a clear abnormality on the transition zone. And this is what we use to make the diagnosis, but this ends up giving us just the, the, the big tumors, the ones that are very evident, and the other ones we have a hard time. The transition zone, it's based on the T2 score that will take you know, credit for the diagnosis. And the, one of the reasons is because all those nodules, those BP8 nodules can have restricted diffusion and DC can have enhancement too. And there are two exceptions, a couple of exceptions when you do you know, scores two or three. But again, it's, the point here is not to go through all of this, but to highlight the fact that it's not a perfect system, it's far from being perfect. Now, what does BPH nodule look like? And so first, they have a category that talks about no BPH. Now, I have no clue what planet they come from, but no BPH doesn't really exist, right? Unless you get a, no, a kid. But they don't happen to really have prostate MRs done. So it doesn't really exist. We never see that. And then you have the BPH nodule that they call, this is the BPH nodule. It has the little rim around it, and you have the really well-defined nodule, and that's fine. No, this is all good. Um, and then you have these guys that are a little bit less defined. They're, they're still stromal tissue, round, um, but not as round as the other one. Uh, so this, this is you know, one of the variants. And then on the top, you have those bends of tissue that just run between nodules. Um, I guess they're just support tissue, I guess, mostly, or scars or whatever they are, what you see. But those are also easy to, 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 to identify. Okay, probably nothing, fairly easy. And then you have the score three, which is something like this here, which is quite not nodular, still you know, um, dark, maybe little specks. Um, so this is a score three. And then you have a score four, which is a clear tumor, and a score five, which is a clear large tumor. So if you look at this here, I already said that we never see a pyrads one on the transition zone, because all men have BPH. So that's kind of off. And then I said that Three is this area that's a little bit ill-defined. It's not a super well-defined nodule, and it's thermal tissue. So what we can actually make the argument that all men that undergo MR have a pyrides three in the transition zone. 
And pi raised 3 is indeterminate. How good is a test that you say, okay, oh man, start with at least uh, I have no clue what's going on. And, and, and this is one of the major limitations of pi raids right now. So that's the score, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and what it means, 3 indeterminate equivocal. Um, and this is another mistake they made because it gives the impression that this is a linear scale because they go from um, very low, highly unlikely, low, unlikely, high, likely, very high, um, highly likely. In this wishful thinking, it doesn't really happen like this. This is the way it really is. When you look at the entire population, all tumors, you have uh, pyrads 1 and 2 being very low probability of having cancer. Again, all men can have BPH, right? Um, and then with a pyrads 3 with a very low uh, risk, not, ignore, not, not something we can ignore, but around 15% maybe. And then you have a bump on the 4s and 5s. 4s about 50%, and then 5s a little bit more. Now you have a variation around that too. Uh, it's not exact. And this is what we found in one of our studies, um, where we had six very experienced radiologists, and you now our scores were all over the, the map. And the reproducibility was just moderate, and it was better for the transition zone than, I mean, better for the peripheral zone than the transition zone, and now you know why, because it, see why that happens. So that's where we're going to make the mistakes. And again, that's the message that we want to deliver. We're going to make more mistakes in the transition zone than in the peripheral zone. This is another study. This was a meta-analysis. And basically, you know, the summary of this is that data in the literature was so heterogeneous that we couldn't really you know, be sure that it was something that we could trust. But looking at it, you now we can see that the numbers you now vary a lot. So if you're looking at high-grade tumors, saying that 3 plus 4 is high grade or above. Um, now we can see that the probability on a, on a, on a Pyrads 5 is not super high here. Now you have to add this up, obviously, right? But it's not 100%. And then this is another study that we did. This was 26 centers. All of them had people doing a lot of prostate MR. And again, now what we found is that the positive predictive rate or the positive ra ratio of, for a Pyrads 2, 3, 4, and 5 was about what is said now, and the twos and threes are probably a, the twos in here are probably overestimated because these are people that had something done, right? But very low for pyrates three, four, and five, seventy-two percent, and a lot of variation. If you look at, you know, the interquartile range for this, so it went from sixty to eighty percent. So now, depending on where you are, you have to know who you're working with, so you know what you can trust. And why is that? It's because they pull it out of their hats. Um, they didn't have data. Now they just came together and said, this is a great idea. I, I had this idea, I'm going to do it, it's fantastic, and you should use it. And now we're collecting data to see how we can make it better. And we're already at the version 2.1, and it will get better. In short, we're trying to find objectivity in something that's not objective, it's subjective. And there will be always people that will look at it in different ways. Good news is that um, it is work in progress. And even better news is that MRI is not the same as pyrads. So I, I, I'm a breast pathologist. It seems like they're trying to create something similar to pyrads. Yeah. For, for breast imaging, right? Yeah. But, the, but in pyrads, it actually it works pretty well, from my understanding. So they, maybe they jumped the gun a little? Yeah. So the, well, the comment was that pyrads was an attempt to recreate what birads was with breast imaging. But BIRADS works really well, and PIRADS not as much, or not, as, not to the extent we would like it to. And that's true. Uh, one of the main differences is, the two main differences. One, BIRADS is 10 years ahead of PIRADS. So they had more data already, so they, they, they fix it. Um, and they know that a BIRADS 3 is 2%, for example. That's established and easy to do. The other thing, too, is that they're looking at one test. They're looking at one test, it's a radiograph, there is very little variability around. The quality can be bad, but assuming that it's a good quality, a calcification on a radiograph is pretty much a calcification on any radiograph. It's, that's basically what it is, a radiograph, fancy radiograph. Well, on the MR, we're looking at T2, diffusion, post runs enhanced, endorectal coil, no endorectal coil, um, high B value, low B value, um, and so on. So it, it, there's many, many more variables there. And they didn't start with data. But that is true. That is correct. Now, pyrads and MR are not the same thing. So just because pyrads is not perfect, it doesn't mean that it cannot become perfect because it's work in progress. 
It also doesn't mean that we can just not discard pyrads and create something else. Maybe there's a new sequence that will come and it will be much better. All right? Um, and that's what this says. It's not perfect, but it's good enough in getting better. There are other things we can do. Now, so these are some of the sequences that people are developing, or some of the tools, they're not all sequences. So readout, uh, segmented multi-shot API is an idea to decrease distortion. Um, RSI is uh, a way to decrease distortion and look at various components, um, microscopic components, so intracellular, extracellular. Hybrid multi-dimension combines two different sequences and so on. The artificial intelligence is the big new thing. Um, new scanners. There is now what they call synthetic MR, which you acquire one sequence, and then using artificial intelligence and the data for the one sequence, you reconstruct all the other sequences, for example. And the idea is that will increase accessibility, decrease costs, um, but it will also increase questions. And we'll have to study all that. Um, we're coming to the end um, here. So just to mention MR after radiation therapy, the gland, as you know, will scar down, will shrink, and, uh, but it all becomes dark. So the T2 becomes really you know, uh, inadequate for assessment. It would definitely depend on other sequences. This is the sensitive specificity of T2, and you can see an ADC map showing a very obvious local recurrence that we cannot see in the T2. And uh, we could use spectroscopy at the time too, and we can use contrast enhancement as you can see in the last image there. So for radiation therapy, we definitely depend on additional sequences, and we, we want to improve our sequences because you can have all these other things happening. You know, so, you know, sometimes we have patients that underwent PPI brachy and you have a gazillion pieces of metal causing artifact. So we need to deal with that as well. Um, and again, that matters because we may make mistakes, and then when you get a biopsy, you will you know, have something that you have to look at. And these are some unusual cases that we can um, now see every once in a while. So it's not only the usual you know, uh, bread and butter uh, adenos, but we have cyst adenomas, stump, uh, the mucinous type, a basal cell. And each of these has their sort of not particular characteristics on imaging, just as they do in pathology. We're not 100% certain all the time, but we can bring some different types of diagnosis as well. So in summary, it's, it's a lot to cover in an hour, and it's um, way too much. Um, but what I want to say is that MRI works well in some cases, not all. Expertise is crucial. We need to have good people reading these cases. And then the message that I want to give to you, pathologists, is that if we're looking in the peripheral zone and you have a PIRADS4 or a PIRADS5 lesion described, it should correlate with something large or high grade on pathology. If it doesn't, Either there is a mimic, a mimicker, or we missed, no, it has to be a mimicker. And maybe there's inflammation, I gave the example of BCG, but it can be any type of prostatitis. Um, and, and, and mention this is helpful because now we get better because we recognize it, and the urologists don't get mad because, hey, what's going on here? Now, now you call this and the pathologist says benign tissue. Well, it's benign tissue with inflammation, right? And that explains it, and then they settle it and they're happy with it. If, if we have a PIRADS3, then things are you know, less likely to be positive and be high grade, so don't be surprised if it's negative. And if there's no peripheral zone lesions described on MRI, PATH should be negative, because they still will do a, a systematic biopsy, right? They will do the targets on the target we described, and then they do the systematic component. Um, so if there is no target, you know, we call it negative. So if you do find something, it should be small and low grade or lower grade. If you find something that's big and bad, we missed it. And it's good for us to know as well. In the transition zone, I already mentioned that it's very challenging. And in the end, you're either playing with sensitive and specificity. I tend to be more specific. Um, but if, um, if we have something that is a PIRATS5, something that's very obvious, there should be tumor there most of the times. Not, not always, but most of the times. Um, the mimicker, the main mimicker will be stromal tissue. And, and if you have that, and, and you can see that it's clearly stromal tissue, it's good to, to let us know. PIRADS 4, 50-50, not necessarily always positive. A PIRADS 3 is essentially a negative result. So if someone is describing a PIRADS 3 in the transition zone, and it was targeted by urology, um, you should expect it to be negative, really, unless the radiologist miscalled it. Um, and then don't be surprised if 
you do see tumor in the treasure zone, and we didn't call anything because it just mimics benign tissue for us, and we have a very, very hard time. So the final comment that MR is, is not perfect, but it's definitely an improvement of what we had before. Um, and it does impact patient care and satisfaction. Now we get, uh, at least I get emails from patients all the time. They ask me to read cases and I just send an email and they're very, very appreciative of it. Um, technology changes quickly, time flies. So everything I'm saying now may not be true tomorrow. And we're striving to get something that's simple, something that's fast, something that's reproducible and something that's accurate. And why not say beautiful? Don't forget that these guys are behind our slides and our images. And I think that's something that it's easy for radiologists and pathologists to forget. And with that, I would like to thank you, and especially Mary for, for the invitation. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna put this here, because otherwise uh, uh, they'll, they'll punish me. Don't forget to, to complete the form. And, and here's the form. <laughs> Thank you. Um, applause in the background and the foreground. And a couple of questions. Um, let's see, do you have any ones in chat or in the room? I don't think any the chat ones in the room. And if not, I have a general question. But, uh, <clears throat> the thought that you, you commented on uh, quantitation of some of the parameters in the images. Uh, being a pending way to look at the parameters. So here I think in pathology, we have some uh, variable even quantitative aspects. The quantitative one would be with reference to the number of tumor cells within a unit area. And we also have different variants of gleason patterns. So we think of gleason pattern four being composed of small group form glands, large group form glands, they can be densely packed, poorly formed glands, or loosely spaced uh, poorly formed glands. So what do you think about that heterogeneity of cellularity and even of um, cells of different grades, least grades? Yeah. Um, and, and that's one of the things I try to, to, to highlight with the, with the voxels, right, with the mixed component. I put two things, I put water and dirt, but really, you have water, you have dirt, you have the, the dirt that's wet with the water, you have pebbles, you maybe have fish bones, and you have, there's so many other things there. And it's, uh, with the current technology, I, I think it's impossible to, to get that granular. Um, not yet. Now again, there are new techniques coming, there are new things that are being developed, and I, I do think the future will look different. One of the things that I, when they first started with PSMA, I was thinking, oh wow, all they did is they took PSMA and they linked it to, you know, to, to, to a radio pharmaceutical they can actually image. Can't we just stick this in you know, gadolinium to and uh, image with MR and, and see what happens? Now you inject it and maybe you wait a little bit longer and then everything washes out except where the tumor is. Um, and I, I actually went online and there was a group in China that was trying to combine GAD and PSMA, but I don't, I don't think the signal is enough. It's not like there's enough signal to see it. But as we develop new you know, scanners, more powerful scanners, cheaper scanners, maybe the, there will be signal. And then there will be things that are markers like that, I, I suspect. If it's going to be PSMA, who knows, but you know. And, and I also I think we all appreciate your um, associating and uh, here's, I think, going forward, we can indicate in pathology reports when we review the MRI for a given patient. That would be opportune to give that sort of feedback between our radiologic perspectives and pathology perspectives. Exactly. So that, to me, is, is a good take-home message for us in pathology. Yeah, and the, um, the group at UCLA, so pathology, radiology, and urology, they created, I'm not sure they still have it, but they used to have a single report so it was like a little package that included you know, some clinical information, surgery information, the PAP report, and uh, the, the radiology report. Um, and obviously these cases were very often discussed in you know, tumor boards and things like that. And I, I mentioned to you that I wanted to do you know, a radiology, pathology meeting and used to have it in the past before I got here. Unfortunately, things are still a little challenging for us, but. Uh, and not, not only busy, but we lost half of the people, right? So, 
It's very, very busy. <laughs> but now we'll get there, we'll, we'll do it, and, and, and I think that it's, it's good for everyone, right? It's good for all of us. Um, great talk, thank you very much. Uh, so clearly radiology is ahead of pathology in terms of digitization uh, of images. Um, we're catching up slowly. Uh, but uh, where do you see AI making the first inroads into daily clinical practice in radiology, perhaps as a preview for what we might see, you know, a few days down the road in pathology? All right, so I'll remind you that I have a disclosure there, I have $5,000 only in shares in the company that will probably disappear. But um, I, I think we're still a ways. Um, so, so first, depends on what you want, right? So we use it clinically already because it's segmentation of the glands is done you now immediately with you now several softwares. And we then use that to, to help your audience to guide biopsy. So that's done quickly. Now, on the diagnostic part, so, so this is not really what we asked. Now, on the diagnostic part, when will AI identify a tumor and, and do it better than the radiologist does, or maybe does do it faster or, or cheaper than the radiologist, right? Um, and there are many, many alternatives and many groups trying to get that done. Um, the main issue right now is volume of data, and, and in part because <laughs> because of the heterogeneity, right? It's so heterogeneous that you have a lot of everything that's part of that heterogeneity to be able to get something that's meaningful. You need to have not only the, the pathological heterogeneity, but the scanner heterogeneity, the protocol heterogeneity, and, and et cetera, you know, the contrast heterogeneity. All of those things need to be considered. You now, uh, patient age, patient um, ethnicity, and, and we don't have that. So. It will take a while, I think. We have local small things that show promise, but I think that's where we are for, for, for quite a while still. Okay, I think we're, we're at the end of the time. Dr. Wessler, thank you again. And for the audience, <clears throat> let me remind you to please do evaluation so we can keep this a dynamic process and also claim your CME credits going forward. So. Thanks very much, and that completes our great rounds of today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you.